I'm going to go through a few case studies and show uh, the sort of methodologies that we use. The three case studies I want to talk to you about uh, increase in their complexity. First of all, I'll talk to you about Design Bugs Out, which focused on a specific issue. Then the Resus Station project, which focused on a specific process. And then finally, the DOME, or Designing Out Medical Error project, which considered a system of multiple processes. I want to talk to you about designing in healthcare. A lot of design is focused on consumer goods and services where the ultimate user is the customer and everything is designed to appeal to them. Um, but I want to show you that designing within healthcare environments is very different. 자, 우리가 그저이 의료 그래서 헬스케어에서 디자인하는 것에 대해서 좀 말씀을 드리는데 우리가 보통 디자인을 할 때는 어떤 그 소비자 제품이나 서비스 그러니까 아, 이그 그 실제로 사용하는 사람이 커스터머인 그런 경우가 많죠. 그런데 헬스케어 쪽은 조금 상황이 다릅니다. 그러니까 커스터머하고 실제 사용자가 다른 그런 경우가 많다는 거죠. 여기에 대해서 조금 말씀을 드릴게요. Designers can feel lost. Uh, healthcare environments can be quite alien to designers. Um, it's full of staff who have specialist knowledge and patients with a variety of complicated conditions. So how do you design for complex systems? What do you do when there are a number of factors which are related but constantly changing? How do you define the problem? And how do you make sure that even if your design does solve a problem, it doesn't introduce other problems? In essence, our work consists of constantly looking up towards the bigger picture of the system and at the same time focusing down on the more practical details of both the research and the design. Uh, in 2003, the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design uh, undertook research for the Department of Health in the UK, uh, which resulted in the Design for Patient Safety report. And this involved uh, engaging a wide number of people who were involved in healthcare, uh, and we mapped out the healthcare systems and their supporting systems as well. And it involved design thinking right at the start of the innovation process. And it led to the recognition of a lot of problems with design within healthcare, uh, particularly affecting patient safety or medical error. Uh, Professor Leap, who's a lead leader in the field of patient safety, gave this excellent quote. Um, 
human beings make mistakes because the systems, tasks and processes they work in are poorly designed. 아, 그래서 이것을 통해서 저희가 디자인 잘못된 부분에 대해서 굉장히 많은 이슈를 도출을 했습니다. 그래서 그런 그 문제들 보면 대부분 환자의 안전이라든가 아니면 의료상의 어떤 실수, 에러 이런 것과 관련이 있는 게 많았고요. 어, 이 분야에서 가장 이제 그 전문가라고 할수 있는 민 교수님이 이런 얘기를 했었어요. 사람들이 실수를 하는 이유는 시스템이나 타스크나 아니면 프로세스가 제대로 디자인이 안 되기 때문에 생긴다라는 얘기를 했었거든요. So the result was the report which was issued to uh, the design community and it paved the way for a number of uh, healthcare projects at the Helen Hammond Centre for Design. Uh, the modern bed space uh, in a hospital is a really complicated mix of equipment. 우리가 그 현대의 뭐 병원에 가보면은 굉장히 이그 침상 주변에 굉장히 복잡한 그런 기계도 많고 그런 그 스페이스가 생기죠. Uh, and the kit is often designed without a thought for the bigger picture. 그런데 이그 하나 하나 기구를 어, 그 디자인할 때는 그것만 어, 생각을 하지 이것이 어떤 커다란 맥락에서 사용되는지 생각을 안 하는 경우가 많습니다. So this picture. Um, is uh, connections for gas tubing. Different drugs are given by the anaesthetist to, pre to prepare the uh, patient for surgery. And it's important to give the right drug, the right gas, at the right time. Um, these connections in, have been specifically designed to be very easy to use, um, but the result is they can all be connected to one another, and that means that you can connect the wrong gas up to the patients with terrible consequences. Um, Professor Jim Reason, who's a psychologist, came up with this model uh, for how things go wrong in healthcare. It's called the Swiss cheese model. So in this figure, uh, each block of cheese is a barrier intended to stop errors occurring. But the problem is that each block has holes, uh, so mistakes can cause harm when they pass through all of these blocks and cause harm to the patients. So, for example, if the patient is given the wrong drug, the first block might be staff levels, so nurses are too busy and they're forced to rush. The second might be lighting levels, so it makes it's hard to read the label. And another block might be that uh, often drugs look and sound very similar, making errors more likely. So, for example, if the patient is given the wrong drug, the first block might be staff levels, so nurses are too busy and so these big systemic issues can result in uh, very practical frontline problems. 이렇게 시스템적인 문제 때문에 현장에서의 그런 에러가 생기는 거죠. Uh, and here are a few examples. 예들이 몇개 있습니다. Um, we witness some staff washing their hands with gloves on. Um, 이렇게 그 글러브를 그 끼고 손을 닦는 스태프가 있는 거예요 병원에서. The gloves are already clean. In fact, you're supposed to wash your hands before you put the gloves on. 사실 그, 그 손을 씻고 나서 글러브를 껴야죠. 글러브 자체도 굉장히 깨끗한 거잖아요. Uh, and this was because the gloves dispenser 
was located before the sink. So when staff went to see the patients, they would come to the gloves dispenser first and put the gloves on and then wash the gloves. 네, 이거는 순서가 이그 글로브가 담겨 있는 디스펜서가 있고 그 다음에 싱크가 있습니다. 그러니까 어, 스태프가 오면 환자를 보러 가기 전에 글로브를 먼저 꺼내고 끼고 그 다음에 싱크 차례가 그렇게 되는 거예요. When staff have to write things down, often there's nowhere for them to write. 자기가 뭐를 써야 될때 놓고 쓸 때가 없는 게 문제입니다. And it's inconvenient to write the results straight onto the patient's charts. So staff use scraps of paper to write down the details and then later on plot the charts and this can lead to further errors. Um, if a patient has an infection, um, often uh, they uh, put up infection control signs which are not easily visible. 그다음에 그 이제 감염 가능성 있는 환자 같은 경우에는 이런 사인을 어, 걸게 돼 있는데 잘안 보이게 되거든요. And some signs are, are more detailed, but they're just ignored. So here the sign says uh, that the door should be kept closed, but you can see that the staff find it easier to work with the door open. 그다음에 어떤 사인 같은 경우는요, 굉장히 복잡하게 있어요. 쉽게 지나치게 돼 있습니다. 여기 보면 사인을 자세히 보면은 항상 뭐 병실문을 닫아놔야 된다라고 돼 있는데 문 열어놓고 지금 이런 상황을 보시면. Um, medication cabinets at the bedside allow their contents to spill out when you open them, and they're often located behind other objects in the bed space, which makes it difficult to get to them. Uh, when a nurse gives drugs, they also have to uh, fill in the chart, the drugs chart, um, and this is often separate from where the drugs are. And there's no convenient flat surface to write on the chart. Um, sometimes during staff handover, so when a uh, shift of staff uh, leaves, say from the, the night shift and a day shift comes in, they have to. Uh, communicate information about patients and often they miss off patients. And sometimes um, it occurs in a room like this and sometimes there's not enough places for everyone to sit down. And the printed out sheets that the staff use to keep track of all the tasks that they do um, can be really difficult to read and get very messy. So this Design for Patient Safety report was a landmark report, uh, point and uh, the role of design in healthcare was uh, recognised much more widely as a result. And it led to a number of projects at the Helen Hamlin Centre. We've done many healthcare projects. For example, um, we did some surgical instruments for Depew. Uh, we did a series of publications for the UK's National Patient Safety Agency recommending best design practice. And also I, I have with me a few publications if you'd like to see them. And we've also, uh, in the middle of a large project, looking at the redesign of the emergency ambulance. Um, but one project I'd like to go into more detail on is uh, Design Bugs Out, which is a, a project for the Department of Health and the UK Design Council. Design Bugs Out, 
영국의 보건부 하고 디자인 디자인 카운슬을 이용한 겁니다. Um, healthcare associated infections are never really far from the headlines and they're often a hot political topic. So this project was aimed at seeing what difference design could make. 그래서 사실 뭐 병원에서의 감염이라든가 어, 그 이런 것이 뭐 신문에 나도 하고 그러잖아요. 그래서 저희는 어, 디자인이 그러면 어, 이 문제를 어떻게 해결할 수 있을까에 대해서 좀 봤는데요. The design team visited uh, they did research in four showcase hospitals across the UK. Uh, and we spoke to uh, nurses, infection control experts, um, equipment managers, and the cleaners and patients and so on. And then we moved, we moved from research to design by writing briefs. Um, and we did this by combining our uh, research that we'd done on the wards with uh, research that we'd done on the internet and uh, in literature, as well as uh, consulting experts in uh, infection control and microbiologists. Um, we created a number of briefs, um, six of which we tackled, um, and I'll just go into them in more detail now. Existing blood pressure cuffs uh, use Velcro, and this can be um, a reservoir for infections, and it's often not cleaned between patients, or if they use a disposable cuff, they use it more than once. So our solution was to use magnets uh, within the blood pressure cuff, which means that the cuff itself is very easy to wipe clean and there's no uh, Velcro uh, for bugs to live in. This is a pulse oximeter. It's uh, put on the end of your finger to measure the oxygen levels in your blood. And you can see that it's a complicated assembly of lots of different parts with many small gaps for dirt to be trapped in. So our solution was a single piece molded silicon clip. Very easy to wipe clean. Uh, when we visited the wards, we noticed that the curtains are also quite difficult to clean. Um, so the curtains are often grabbed at many different points, and because the curtains are flexible, it's very difficult to wipe them down. So our solution was to create a handle for curtains which would slot onto the curtains. Which makes it much easier to wipe clean. Uh, we also put magnets in the handles so that they were closed together to improve privacy. Uh, 
uh, we noticed uh, that patients often had no ownership over cleanliness of their space. So our solution was to repackage uh, existing wipes. Wipes are often targeted towards staff, but we made them much more patient friendly, as well as providing a, a clip where you, so you could hang the wipes anywhere in the patient's bed space. Um, cannulae or needles uh, inserted into the patient can also be a serious infection risk. They're supposed to be changed every 72 hours. The problem is it's very difficult to tell how long a needle has been in. So our solution borrows technology from the food industry, which is called a time strip. Um, so when a needle is inserted, uh, the button on the bottom is pressed and the ink uh, migrates up the window. And when it reaches the line, uh, you know that the 72 hour limit has been reached. Um, we also looked at the mattresses. Um, they consist of an outer waterproof layer and an inner foam core. Um, the problem here is that uh, needles or scalpels can make small holes in the waterproof cover and then fluid can get into the foam core and make it contaminated. And it's often impossible to tell uh, just from the outside uh, that the mattress is contaminated. Um, so our solution was to look at the mattress itself, specifically the waterproof outer cover. Um, and we put a uh, hydrochromic ink uh, within the uh, waterproof layer. So um, if the uh, outer layer is pierced and water or fluid gets in, it changes colour. So all of these ideas uh, were uh, showcased across the country and received lots of uh, good feedback from frontline staff. But we found that working with medical staff was not always that easy. <coughs> Clinicians can have very different terminology to designers and often it's difficult to understand to have a shared understanding of a topic. So we needed to find a way of working better together. The factor that made the biggest difference in our approach was time. <coughs> it's probably not a good thing for you to hear because you don't have much time. <laughs> But the more time you spend um, in the environment where your service or product will be used, um, the more you learn. This man is called Edward de Bono. Um, he's written many books on the creative process and has come up with very methodical techniques 
Um, so uh, anyone can use these to think about a specific problem in a creative way. <coughs> and we use these techniques uh, with doctors and nurses and patients as well. And whereas before we were working with teams of healthcare practitioners and we were just lone designers, uh, some clinical staff, um, the ones that we'd had the most contact with, began to think like designers. And this is a really good stage in any project because uh, this person who can do both um, already has credibility amongst their clinical colleagues and is able to get more people to engage in the design. Um, the second large project I'd like to talk to you about is the resuscitation, which looked at the resuscitation process. So if you're in hospital and your heart stops, someone will hopefully notice and they'll send out a call. Um, and a team of medics will rush to your assistance and they'd give you help with breathing, they would uh, give you drugs and they would also give a, your heart an electric shock if necessary. And all the equipment that they use to do these actions is stored on a crash trolley. Um, from 2005 to 2006, there were 86 incidents involving these trolleys, where 13 uh, ended in harm to the patient and 10 uh, even resulted in the patient's death. So the National Patient Safety Agency in the UK wanted to see how a design could make a difference and they formed a collaboration between ourselves at the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design um, and uh, doctors and resuscitation officers from Imperial College London. Uh, and we knew nothing about resuscitation as designers, so the first thing that we did was to try to understand the product. This is a current resuscitation trolley. It holds all the equipment that you need, it's very mobile, it has a fold-out surface and it even has a stand for fluids. But still things were, were going wrong during cardiac arrests. So when we looked at them when they weren't in use, it's clear that they tend to become a bit of a dumping ground. So 
um, doctors might place more equipment on the trolley than necessary just to be on the safe side, or worse, take equipment off if they can't find it elsewhere on the ward. And a general mess means that it's very difficult in an emergency to get what you want. So time is really of the essence. Um, you can see here that it takes the doctor 18 seconds and six attempts to find what he's looking for. So having got to grips with what a crash trolley is, we wanted then to understand the actual process of resuscitation. 그래서 so the team began by reading the relevant literature. Interviewing resuscitation team members. Attending um, advanced life support courses where we learned how to resuscitate people ourselves. And we even witnessed real life cardiac arrests. And this helped us to map out the complicated system of resuscitation along with the demands of products at every step in the process. Um, we found that the main issues were that um, sometimes the drawers won't open properly, so access is difficult. And it's difficult for more than one person to access the trolley at the same time. So the team were then encouraged, including the uh, doctors and nurses and resuscitation officers, uh, they were encouraged to think as radically as possible and get a breadth of ideas. Um, and once we had a breadth of ideas, uh, we then used uh, critical feedback to narrow them down uh, to one final concept. And this is the first prototype. Um, the functions of the prototype support the resuscitation process. All the equipment is laid out openly, so access is much easier. Um, the trolley also splits into three sections. Um, so each team member um, can have their own small trolley. And we also put radio frequency identification technology um, into the trolley so that um, when equipment is removed, uh, the trolley knows that stock is missing. So here's a video of the new prototype being trialed. Um, they've laid out all the sections in one line. And you can see this doctor um, immediately finds what he's looking for. So the design received a few awards. Um, and uh, we uh, attracted the interest of many manufacturers 
um, Bristol Made was the one that was chosen to make the design. Well, um, but as we were uh, designing this with Bristol Made, we wanted to see how we could make the design even better. So we went back to the clinical environment and got people to uh, look at it in much more detail and it came up with uh, three areas where we could still improve the design. The splitting mechanism uh, could be improved, it wasn't very good on that prototype. There were issues with security. So people were concerned that um, doctors or nurses might be able to take equipment off the trolley when there wasn't an emergency, so it wouldn't be fully stocked. And finally, the layout, there were a few little tweaks um, that we wanted to do on the layout. So the revised design was done with Bristol Made. It's much more robust um, and it has a revised mechanism to split the trolley, um, a slightly altered layout, and there are now security blinds within each trolley which uh, roll up to secure each of the uh, items of equipment. So the design underwent uh, a full clinical trial at St Mary's Hospital in London and got a great response from, from my staff. So, so far I've shown you how to design for a particular issue, um, cleaning equipment, uh, how to design for a particular process, resuscitation, and now I want to show you how we took this further uh, to consider complex systems of multiple processes. So this project is called Designing Out Medical Error, or DOME, and it's a three-year project. <coughs> and it aims to understand and map healthcare processes on elective surgical wards. And then use this understanding and maps as an evidence-based design equipment which would better support these processes and reduce error. In a similar way to the infection issue, uh, medical error is never far from the headlines. Um, studies have shown internationally that in up to 10% of all hospital admissions, something goes wrong. So we formed a multidisciplinary collaboration between designers, doctors, ergonomists, business academics and patient safety experts. Um, no single discipline can understand medical error, it's too complicated, so this collaboration was aimed at understanding it from many different angles. So, looking at um, 
the history of the ward. This is a shot from the 1940s, which shows a ward in a typical, what's called a nightingale layout, uh, where everything is open um, and patients have very little privacy. 자 이게 그 역사적으로 우리가 좀 가보면 이제 이번 시기의 시초라고 볼수 있습니다. 그래서 40년대 그 이번 시기의 그림인데요. 어, 소위 이제 나이팅게일 레이아웃이라고 보는 거죠. 모든 게다 오픈돼 있어서 환자가 프라이버시가 거의 없는 그런 상황이죠. And this is a shot uh, from wards today. 현재의 이번 시기 보통 이렇게 생겼죠. Even though a lot of the equipment has changed and been updated, uh, the overarching principles remain the same. 뭐 물론 뭐그 그 기구가 더 길게가 더 좋아졌고 하, 하기는 하지만 기본적인 원칙은 똑같죠. Uh, we wanted to see what really happens to patients in hospital and to find out the actions uh, that take place which aren't very well supported by design. Uh, 그래서 실제 환자들이 입원했을 때 경험이 어떤지를 보고 싶어 했고요. 그다음에 현재 지금 잘안 되고 있는 디자인이 다그 문제를 해결해 주지 못하는 부분은 어딘가를 보려고 한 것입니다. So we began with a whole year of in-depth observations shadowing patients through their journey from admission to discharge. And we used this model um, to have a shared understanding with doctors about the research we were doing. Um, the outer circle is research in the hospital, so in the broader building. And this provided context for more focused research on a hospital ward. And the ward provided context for even more focused work on the bay and immediately around the patient's bed. So we observed the typical processes that happen um, at the bedside and we used a hazard score that we borrowed from other industries uh, to rank them in terms of risk. And these are the results. Uh, hand washing was rated as the most hazardous process. Um, observations monitoring is uh, the um, use of a blood pressure cuff and thermometer to measure. Uh, patient's vital signs. Isolation of infection is uh, aimed at reducing the spread of infection between patients. Medication delivery is the administration of drugs at the bedside. And staff handover uh, is the communicate, communication of information between staff shifts. Um, there were other processes, but we took the top five uh, risky ones uh, forward. 그 외에도 다른 것들 있지만 저희가 리스크가 가장 높은 탑 5 안을 가지고 작업을 시작했습니다. So these five So here's a sample of uh, one of the maps. 그, 그, 어, um, so they were drawn up uh, through observations on the wards, but also they were verified with process experts. And also the process experts were asked to think of all the ways in which each step in the process could go wrong. <coughs> and we then conducted what's called a failure mode and effects analysis. 
그 다음에 저희가 함께 그 페일리어 모드 임팩트 아날리시스 어떤 그 페일리어가 있을 수 있는지 그 다음에 이것이 어떤 영향인지 영향평가를 하는 것이죠. So we uh, assembled a small group of people which consisted of a doctor, a nurse, a patient and an expert. And as a group, uh, they looked at the map that I showed you before. And for each step in the process, the group considered what would happen if things went wrong. And um, they had to give three scores for each step. So, uh, 그 세, 그, 그 um, firstly, was severity, how bad the harm would be to the patient if this step so went wrong. Um, the second is frequency, how often it goes wrong. The third is detectability. How easy it is to see if the process has gone wrong before the patient is harmed. <coughs> and each score was between one and four. So, for example, in hand washing, um, if I just show you the, the previous map. The first step is remember to decontaminate your hands. So in the failure mode and effects analysis, uh, this scored four for severity. Because you could give a patient a fatal infection. It also scored four on frequency because often doctors don't clean their hands. Uh, and it also scored four on detectability. Uh, because hands can appear clean like mine even though they haven't been properly decontaminated with the gel. So that step in the process scored the maximum score and um, all the points where uh, that scored really highly were then put back onto the map. So you can see with the um, the red boxes um, show the particularly hazardous points in the process. And up until this point, the designers were working with the doctors um, as researchers. And now they had to move into the, de the design phase by writing design briefs. And these briefs are very important because they have to capture the issues from the research but also uh, inspire. So, sorry. we arrived at the brief areas um, by grouping the underlying themes coming out of the research into areas to be tackled. Um, and we again more tightly defined these and arranged them around the five processes. We then came up with ideas with the doctors um, and we used the creative techniques um, from Edward de Bono that I told you about earlier. Um, it's important to get a breadth of ideas for each of these briefs. 
그래서 이 브리프에서 아주 다양한 그런 아이디어를 생각을 해보는 것이 굉장히 중요하고요. And we re- received iterative feedback from uh, patients, doctors, and nurses on the ward. 다음에 계속해서 저희 아이디어에 대해서 다시 가서 묻고 다시 가서 묻고 하는 그런 프로세스를 반복을 했고요. And this feedback um, from the experts in the field and also the frontline staff uh, meant that we were able to narrow our breadth of ideas down to a few ones to take forward. 계속해서 반복해서 피드백을 받아서 어, 결국은 저희 아이디어를 조금 더 폭을 좁혀갈 수 있었던 것이죠. So I'll now take you through a selection of the design interventions. 저자님은 어떤 디자인의 인터벤션이 <웃음> 개입이 있었는지에 대해서 좀 말씀을 드릴게요. Um, firstly, hand washing. Um, in the UK, the National Patient Safety Agency had a very successful campaign to promote the use of hand gel. Um, it was very successful, uh, but it targeted the entrance to the wards, and it's much more important to clean your hands at the bedside. 그 병실 바깥에서 손 씻도록 만드는 거거든요. 근데 사실 이 베드사이드에서 이렇게 손 씻는 것이 더 중요한 거잖아요. 병실 밖에 아니라. And they did a number of different campaigns, which meant that there was a, a confusing mix of posters on the ward. 그리고 캠페인을 한번한 게 아니라 여러 번 했어요. 그러다 보니까 여기 굉장히 헷갈리게 복잡하게 뭐 포스터도 붙여지고 하는 것이 될수 있죠. So we designed a simple symbol to denote hand hygiene precautions. 그래서 그 아주 간단하게 심볼을 만들어서 Um, this simplifies the message and it reduces the visual clutter. It's also much easier to put this graphic at the certain points in the bedside where you want people to clean their hands. <coughs> Looking at the vital signs brief, The, uh, there were two main problems. Um, the, f- the image on the left is uh, the current vital signs trolley. Um, the issue here is that it's a, often a complicated tangle of cables and it's very difficult to clean. The image on the right um, shows the charts that the uh, nurses have to plot. We found that often nurses would get the correct reading from the device, but they would plot the data incorrectly or interpret it incorrectly. So there were two main issues, uh, hygiene and information management. 두 가지 문제로 이제 그 정리할 수 있는 게 하나는 위생적인 거, 그 다음에는 정보의 관리가 잘못된 거. So our solution was a redesign of the product and also the accompanying information system. 그래서 여기서는 사용되는 제품을 다시 디자인하고 정보 관리 시스템도 다시 디자인한 거죠. Um, the uh, cables retract into the body of the trolley, which make it easier to clean. And also, uh, we've provided uh, cleaning wipes on the front. Uh, we placed a touch screen on the top of the trolley. Um, and this automatically plots the results coming out of the uh, the blood pressure cuff, the finger clip, and the t- uh, thermometer. And it also interprets um, the results, so it recommends a course of action to the nurse. <웃음> 그 
The isolation of infection brief concerned the use of hand gel, but also the use of aprons and gloves. Um, staff often found that uh, hand gel and the use of aprons and gloves uh, were interruptions to their other tasks. 그런데 실제 스태프들은 뭐 핸드젤도 그렇고 뭐 앞에 애플이라든가 글러브라든가 이런 것이 <웃음> 조금 걸리적거린다라는 그런 얘기를 많이 했어요. So uh, we looked at the sort of tasks and equipment used at the bedside. 그래서 실제로 어떤 것들을 활용을 사용을 하고 있는지 또 어떤 일을 하고 있는지를 테스크를 하고 있는지를 봤는데요. Uh, we found that the medication locker. Um, was very difficult to access. It's often by the wall with a patient sitting in front of it. There was nowhere um, for the doctors to put uh, their uh, sharps, their uh, needles, or their scalpels. If they wanted to use aprons and gloves, they often had to go out to the corridor to get them. And also, uh, there was no flat surface for writing or for reading documents. Uh, and one patient summed it up really well for us. He said, that's all you see, isn't it? People running from one side of the bed to another saying, get me this, get me that. Um, we work with clinical staff uh, to see if we could come up with an idea of a one-stop shop um, of commonly used equipment in the bed space. They helped us to define uh, a list of things that would go in it and where it would go. And this is the first prototype. We called it the care station. Uh, it has aprons and gloves. Um, a space for a sharp spin. It has cleaning wipes, alcohol gel, a flat surface for writing, and a, a medication locker. And this uh, hooks on the end of the bed. And we got feedback from over a hundred staff across three different hospitals. And we developed the idea further with a manufacturer. From the user feedback, we added a clinical waste bin. And it no longer hooks on the bed, it's freestanding. And we produce six of these for clinical trial. We tested it in simulation. So here I am pretending to be a patient. Um, a series of nurses performed uh, clinical tasks on me. So. Um, they gave me drugs, uh, they took my vital signs, and they removed a fake needle from my arm. So we, we recorded their actions with a video camera. And we plotted their positions. So we performed what's called a link analysis, where you uh, draw a map of where the nurse is walking. The image on the left in the green uh, shows uh, the footfall of the nurse without the care station. And uh, the dark blue on the right is with the care station. And you can see that um, 
on the left there's lots of walking around and on the right uh, it saves a lot of walking around. And as well as this simulation study, uh, we did a much more in-depth full clinical trial, um, which has now, uh, the results have been published and show that it does improve the use of hand gel and aprons and gloves. So we revised the design a little bit more, making it smaller and easier to clean. And it's now manufactured in the UK uh, by Bristol Made under the name Care Centre. <coughs> so that concludes the case studies. And what have we learned? We've learned that collaboration is needed to understand the interactions between the product, information and service within healthcare. I'd like to just finish with a couple of slides which illustrate the methodology that we use. Even the best teams can lose if they don't work well together. This is a traditional model of the design process in healthcare. It's a bit like a relay race. Um, the clinical staff um, define the problem and they pass the baton on to the designers who often haven't seen the problem firsthand. Uh, they then design a prototype and hand it back to the clinicians who then pass the baton on to a manufacturer. And by the time the final design comes back into the clinical space, it's not what the staff wanted. So we try to structure our approach more like a rowing team. All the different disciplines are in the same boat. At different stages in the process, different team members lead and the other team members learn. In this way, uh, designers can learn about clinical research, clinical staff can learn about design and so on. And we've now showed through clinical trial that this approach does indeed make a tangible difference and reduce medical error. Thank you very much for listening.